So we'll go ahead and gently begin by just welcoming you to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Really nice to have everybody here together in person and online. <clears throat> and this is our Wednesday Well of Being. I'm Eve Ekman, one of the regular teachers here on Wednesdays with Lopan Chandra Easton. And we are so fortunate to have Tig O'Malley with us tonight. Uh, we are revving up to do some teaching together this weekend, and we thought, why not start the week right? <clears throat> and so, um, as many of you know, we've been coming regularly. We've been making our way through this beautiful text. This is the Old Path, White Clouds, and it's um, a text compiled by Thich Nhat Hanh that stitches together the biographical stories of the Buddha uh, as best we know. And we have made our way through I think almost 19 chapters at this point. And the Buddha has just woken up beneath the Bodhi tree and he is giving his very first teachings. And the first teachings, spoiler alert, are on the Four Noble Truths. So we started talking a little bit last week on the Four Noble Truths. Old Path, White Clouds. Highly recommended. It's not one of those books that makes you feel good about reading it. Like, oh, I should read that. That's like one of those books I should. It, it is so enjoyable. Is it good on Audible? Or good? No idea. And so it's um, it's stories that, you know, each one kind of gives us a bit of a, a resonance to what it's like to not just hear about the teachings, but to discover the teachings through your lived experience. So as though you were so aware and attentive to all the things that are agitating you and inspiring you that the path just unfolds from there. So it's just such a beautiful book. Um, and we're going to kind of look in a little bit to this aspect where he talks about the Four Noble Truths and kind of pause there. It's such an essential part of uh, the whole Buddhist path is these Four Noble Truths. And if you've never heard of them, gosh, you're in for such a treat. Uh, if you have heard of them, we're going to enliven them, see if we can get our way through all four. Even if we get just through the first two, it will be wonderful. And we'll start with a meditation as usual, and then move into our time of discussion and connection. And especially so wonderful to have some new um, faces here tonight. Just the way that we really orient ourselves here at the Dharma Collective, it's a volunteer-run center. We literally exist here because there is a sense of shared care and generosity. And we could all just be at home, you know, listening to a pre-recorded talk, but we're here live together because of that essential element of the Sangha and community, knowing that when we practice with others, maybe there's a way that we can experience a sense of connection that helps us drop into practice. But also when we practice with others, we get to hear from others. We get to see the wisdom of these teachings that we're all experiencing through different lived experiences and lives and voices. And such an important part of sharing means that we kind of want to keep some sense of, what's the right word, um, kind of coherence in how we share. So when we will be sharing some ideas about uh, these Four Noble Truths, we'll be asking for your reflections. And when we do so, remember that as you're listening, doing so with deep compassion, as you're sharing, sharing from deep compassion. So sometimes that means, you know, not always talking. Sometimes that means talking when it isn't usually your normal habit. And so our invitation is to use this time of discussion and community together as just as essential as your rest of your practice of meditation. So especially since tonight is just a unique gathering of beings, unlike has ever been here before and may ever be again, or like a community for tonight. So if you haven't already, maybe just looking around at your community, folks online, hello, establishing a sense of engagement, empathy. Yeah. So with that, I'll hand it over to my dear friend. May I hold the book? You may. <laughs> um, so this book is hands down my favorite book. Uh, I'm not a big reader, but this got me like hook, line, and sinker. 
Um, many of you that know me know that I lived in a monastery in the Himalayas for a while, and I read this book three times while I was there and then transcribed it and rewrote it because it, I felt like this transmission that was coming through hearing um, the narration of the Buddha's life, and especially from the time that he realized enlightenment forward, where it was almost like hearing about his, uh, his mind, his omnipotent mind. Mm -hmm. It was almost like I was receiving a transmission as I was reading it. So uh, I had already been studying the Dharma. I've been practicing for a long time before I read this, but it really <clears throat> clicked something into place for me to kind of hear it less as a, as a student receiving a teaching and more of like learning about this uh, embodied presence, this embodied heartfulness that the Buddha had um, was this, this book has been one of the best teachers for me. So I'm super glad to be sharing this mm. with all of you tonight. And, you know, just following on what he was saying about kind of being together, practicing together, that the point that we're at the book, and we'll talk about it tonight when we read some of these pages, is that um, leading up to his enlightenment and then just after the Buddha was practicing with his, with his Sangha, mm. five or six of his practice mates, if you will. And so it's important that we have this community together that we're not practicing in isolation. And one of the things that I love most about um, retreats and, and classes like this is the majority of the time, except for when we're sharing our experiences, we're in silence, mm -hmm. we're building community and we're not even talking. That's super powerful for me, you know, like the power of the mm -hmm. practice. Um, so I wish all of that for you tonight. Um, so as Eve was mentioning, the um, topic tonight is going to be the Four Noble Truths, which are really about um, suffering. Uh, and so we're going to do a practice to lead into our time together tonight on suffering. Um, so many of you may be familiar with um, this acronym RAIN, Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Nurture. Um, it was kind of codified by Tara Bach is a uh, meditation teacher and a psychologist um, based on the traditional teachings of the Dharma. Um, but uh, we're gonna follow through that. We'll, we'll settle in, we'll take some time to just arrive into the space, into our bodies. And then we'll follow this acronym of recognizing what's here, allowing it, investigating how it feels. And then we'll apply some nurturing in the form of self-compassion. Along the way, I'll offer some different techniques. There'll be a little bit of breath work, a little bit of visualization, a little bit of mindfulness. And as the Buddha taught us uh, to take what works for you, you know, mm -hmm. don't take anything on blind faith, check it out for yourself and see what works. If visualization is not your thing, totally fine to leave that out. And last thing before we jump in is just a really an invitation to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you have agency in this practice, you have choice. So again, if something's not feeling uh, right for you, back off. You know, if we're in exploring suffering and it becomes overwhelming for you, perhaps bring your attention back to your breath or the feeling of the body on the chair or the ground, maybe open the eyes and look around the room. Um, everything that I offer in this practice is an invitation, not a command. So really just listen to what you need and take care of yourself. Okay. So with that, let's start to transition into a period of practice. <clears throat> maybe for you, that means closing the eyes or perhaps keeping them open and just softening the gaze. and making this transition from the outer world, a world of striving and doing and goals, to turning our attention to the inner world, a place of intention and ease and being. And so just noticing what's here, What's the energy that you're carrying into our time together tonight? Perhaps noticing a particular energy in the body.
Noticing what's here in the mind. Perhaps lingering energy from conversations today, maybe to-do lists or plans. And not trying to ch change or fix anything, just noticing, recognizing what's happening in the mind, no way that it should or should not be. The mind's busy, the mind is busy. Then let's take a moment to come to the seat of emotions, checking in with the heart. And what's here right now in the emotional landscape? And pausing for a moment here to set an intention for this practice, for our time together tonight. Perhaps just to be present or not to judge yourself. Maybe to be relaxed or open-minded. Taking a moment to breathe into that intention. And as you exhale, letting go of any expectation of what that might look like in this practice. And then to help us arrive more fully, let's bring the attention back into the body if that's the uncomfortable. And noticing the contact the body making with a chair or a cushion or the floor. Just allowing the awareness to drop out of the thinking mind and down into the felt experience of the body. Feeling that steady, stable ground rising up to meet you. Even if the mind is moving quickly, we can practice a sense of stability just by feeling this ground beneath us, the support rising up to hold us, to support our practice. And then taking a moment to bring the attention up to the spinal column, perhaps breathing in a sense of straightening or lifting through the vertebrae, just very gently coming into a dignified posture, inviting a sense of vividness into the attention just by noticing this upright posture, perhaps a lengthening from the tailbone all the way up to the crown of the head. With the steady ground beneath us and the vividness of our attention through the posture can also invite a sense of ease and relaxation into the body, into the mind. And softening the muscles around the eyes, checking that the jaw is soft, the shoulders are relaxed, checking if there's any squeezing or bracing in the abdomen or pelvic floor, Perhaps just bringing our attention to these areas of the body, we notice that there's a release. And if there is tension in the body that doesn't let go or release, perhaps we can just soften the mind around that tension. So here we are grounded, with a vivid attention and a relaxed mind and body. Perhaps you'd like to take a few deep breaths in and out, just to continue calming the body, arriving into this moment, welcoming the breath as it arrives into the body and then relaxing as it flows out.
if you were doing some deep breaths, perhaps returning to a natural breathing rhythm. As we start to make a transition into the main part of our practice, let's bring our awareness to an aspect in life right now that may be unpleasant or unsatisfactory. Maybe it's a specific part of the body where there might be discomfort. Maybe it's an intrusive thought, maybe a difficult emotion, maybe something hard that's happening at work or in a personal relationship. And right now I like to think of this as reading the headline of what's difficult, not getting into the story just yet but just noticing what's here and perhaps not the hardest thing or anything that might be traumatizing, something that feels workable in this moment, something that feels okay to explore. And if at any point in this practice, you notice the mind moving away to this invitation, away from this invitation to reflect on something difficult, we can use our mindfulness as a tool to notice that the mind has slipped away and gently come back. No problem, just an opportunity to practice. And as we continue resting, our attention on this difficulty that we're experiencing in life. We'll begin with recognizing what's here. Maybe naming this discomfort. Maybe saying, ah, oh, this is what anger feels like or sadness feels like. And so recognizing that this is difficult, this is suffering. And then moving to an allowance of what's here. So oftentimes we push away what's difficult. Our aversion kicks in and we don't want to feel that way. And here it's an invitation to welcome it, to allow it to be here. It doesn't mean that we like it, just that it's here. Instead of pushing against it, we can soften, allow it. As one of my favorite poets, Donna Fold says, resist and the tides will sweep you off your feet. Allow and they'll carry you to higher ground. So just allowing this difficulty and any sensations that may accompany it to be here. It's part of the human experience. It's part of your present moment. And then let's take some time to investigate this a little bit more deeply. So as we hold our attention to this difficulty, notice what arises in the body. Perhaps there's a shift in energy that's unpleasant. Maybe it's a particular part of the body where we might be feeling constriction or tightness. 
maybe it's an energy flooding the arms or the heart rate increasing or tightness in the lower back or stomach. Just taking some time to investigate how this may be showing up in the body. And being curious, what is this like? Is there a color or a texture to this sensation or discomfort? Is there a sense of movement, perhaps fluttering or spiraling? Maybe there's a sense of temperature to this sensation. And exploring the boundaries of where you can feel this discomfort. Perhaps there's a, a shape or an edge that you're aware of. And again, these are all just invitations to investigate and feel more deeply how this dissatisfaction or unpleasantness may be showing up in the body. Remembering if it becomes overwhelming or too much, you can always return to uh, awareness of the breath or open the eyes for a few moments. And if and when you feel ready to return into the practice, returning to investigating these sensations. Is it shifting or changing as you rest your attention with it? And then transitioning to taking some time to nurture ourselves. So perhaps you'd like to imagine you could direct the breath into this part of the body, breathing into that sensation, a sense of expansion on the in-breath and then relaxing and letting go on the out-breath. Perhaps you like to visualize a nurturing energy coming into the body and wrapping this unpleasantness, comforting it, soothing it. Maybe it's like a sensation of wrapping yourself or this discomfort in a warm blanket. Perhaps offering some phrases of self-compassion to ourselves for this way that we're suffering. Sometimes it can be supportive just to say, it makes sense that I feel this way. I'm not wrong or broken. This is part of being human. And I'll offer a couple more phrases of self-compassion. You may want to try on repeating them silently in your mind after me, or perhaps just resting with the sentiments of, the wor of these words. But offering these aspirations as a gift to yourself, a form of nurturing the suffering. May I accept this moment exactly as it is. May I accept myself exactly as I am. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I have all the courage and compassion that I need to face this difficulty.
And again, just noticing what's coming up. If there's resistance to these phrases, or the sensations seem to intensify, an invitation to be with that. Continue exploring the response to this practice. Perhaps repeating these phrases once again. May I accept myself. May I be kind to myself. May I have all the courage and compassion I need to face this. Let's take a moment just to zoom out and call to mind that there are countless others in this world right now that might be feeling something similar. Perhaps different causes and conditions, but there are other beings out there that are feeling something similar. And so you're not alone. It's part of being human. and see what it feels like to offer these phrases of compassion to other beings that might be struggling or suffering in a similar way. May you accept this difficulty. May you accept yourself exactly as you are. May you have all the courage and compassion you need to face this. May you be kind to yourself. Before we come to an end of this practice, let's take a moment to let go of any visualization or thought forms and just return to an open awareness of what's here now. Body, mind, heart. Has anything shifted or changed over the course of this practice? Perhaps for some of us, there's a sense of ease and allowance. Perhaps for others, it's stirred things up, a sense of agitation or irritation, and that's okay. It's just a practice. Before we transition out of this practice, setting an intention for how you can continue nurturing yourself. How can you take care of yourself in this moment? Is there anything that you need? Breathing into that intention. And on the out breath, letting go taking your time to transition out of this practice, perhaps wiggling the fingers and toes, inviting movement back into the body, returning to open eyes if they were closed and inviting an awareness of light and each other. Thank you all for that practice. Before we move into our talk for the night, is there anything coming up that anyone would like to share or ask questions about with that practice? <laughs> the bell would like to share. <laughs>
Does anyone have a hard time with self-compassion and nurturing? We have uh, someone online um, raise their hand. Great. Go ahead. Uh, you can Maria, please go ahead. You're unmuted. Thank you. That was sort of accidental. I was raising my hand to say, yes, I have a hard time with self-compassion, but I was, you know, this practice was perfect for me right now because I've had some it's like, you know, the tangle is untangled to this point and now all this stuff is just releasing. Like when you pull out the furniture and there's all this stuff back there, just collected and um, it's hard, it's hard, but there's no way to um, let it metabolize unless I address it and sort of, um, or just be with it, I guess. And so this practice was um, appropriate for me right now. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. There's a, a concept, especially with this, the self-compassion aspect called backdraft. Um, like any of you have seen that movie, it's a phenomenon that happens with firefighters when there's a smoldering fire in a room and they open the door and oxygen rushes in and it ignites the fire. And so it's described that sometimes opening the doors of the heart can actually cause backdraft where there's a lot, as we heard, um, there can be a lot of things in there that are all tangled up. And when we bring our compassionate awareness into those areas of difficulty, it can feel like it's blowing up or it's getting bigger. And the invitation here is to realize this is practice, you know, holding whatever happens in that nurturing phase with a gentleness, remembering that there's no expectation that it's, you know, there's no magic wand that it's going to just disappear mm -hmm. and just having the courage and the compassion to stay with it and know that the more that we do this, the more that we strengthen those pathways of compassionate presence, uh, the better that we can be with it. So thank you for sharing that. So we're going to move on. If anything comes up about that practice at, online, if you'd like to add it into the chat or you know, we'll have lots of time to continue our dialogue uh, in our talk tonight. So please feel free to um, share more if things come up. So just to um, remind folks, if you weren't here last week or recently, we're catching up with Buddha. Again, this is, this is about... A, think about three weeks after he has this true breakthrough in his practice and sees um, such a beautiful line back here, but essentially seeing the entire universe in the leaf, seeing all the clouds that led to the leaf, seeing the water, seeing that, you know, this unbelievable interconnection between all things and the liberation of his own mind. Um, and after he has this experience, this waking up evening, he gives himself a couple weeks to just enjoy. He spent nine years, you know, first going to other teachers and listening and taking knowledge, finding disappointment with the other teachers and knowledge because they don't quite give him access to true freedom from um, sickness, old age, and death. Uh, they can temporarily alleviate some of the stress of everyday life, and that is wonderful but they don't truly get underneath to the root of suffering and they don't help others. So he continues his explorations and <clears throat> he is a very bright student by all of these biographical accounts. And one of the last teachers he's with, um, I don't think it's Master Alara, it's Master Udana at this point. And in this last uh, group that he's studying with, five of the other um, students who are with him decide to leave with the Buddha. Oh, at that time, it's just uh, Siddhartha. They're like, this, this young man is really onto something. We really believe in what he's doing. We think that he's going to find the way. And when they left, they decided to really pursue this path of intense austerity. They decided that if the body was getting what it needed and was nourished, it was like wet wood. 
it wouldn't be able to like, ignite the fire of awakening. So they go into this period where there's very little food, very little water, you know, just practicing nonstop. And um, the it's amazing. Siddhartha has this, this moment where he, he's like the most austere of the austere, like going for it. Right. And he has just this gentle breathe come over him. It's been a hot, really hot period of time in the forest. Of course, there's like no shelter of any kind. They're just there beneath all the elements, a really hot day. There's this cool breeze. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, the body. Like it feels so good to be in the body. Why was I denying the body in my practice? And has this realization that then um, he decides he wants to wade into the river and he's so weak famished right barely can like his skin's hanging off and some of you maybe have been to traditional temples and they have the buddha of self-mortification looks like a halloween sculpture of sorts it's like oh, you know it's like ridge showing it looks really um you know intensely hollowed out so he barely makes it to the river almost gets carried away and this young girl who has come to the forest with kind of offerings, right? At this time, there are many uh, ascetics and monks wandering the land, and it's traditional for people in the village to offer, to give generosity. She runs into this figure who's almost falling over and gives a little bit of milk into his mouth. Um, they didn't have plant milk at the time, but, you know, probably some hopefully well-taken care of cows who offered freely their milk. And uh, and the Buddha, you know, starts getting this nourishment. And at this time, you know, he starts to get the nourishment. This young um, girl from the village is bringing these offerings. His friends see him by the river and they're like, loser, quitter. That guy gave up. He doesn't know what he's doing. Right. So they go off on their way and he is just experiencing such a richness of practice, having discovered that re-inhabiting his body is going to be the way. And he's like, I'll find my friends later. So he wakes up and then he goes to find his friends. And it's really funny. We talked about this last week in the passage where his five friends, they see him coming and they're like, that guy. He like eats food. He hangs out. Judgy. Yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. You know, cow's milk. Doesn't even know about the oat milk latte. Mm, whatever it is. And they're like, let's snub him. Like, let's not even give him a welcome when he comes. And then he like, you know, waltzes in and um he doesn't really waltz i'm sure he's just walking beautifully <laughs> but he has like a glow and all of their intentions are hopes to snub him like someone's like fanning him someone's bringing him like water to like bathe his feet and the other person's just like running around what do i do oh my god they realize immediately like oh my god he he got something we need to learn and so the first things he says to him um you know, um, he says, my brothers, I have found the way. I will show it to you. And still they're like half believing him. And he says, but Siddhartha, you abandoned the path halfway. You ate rice and drank milk. You spent time with the village children. How can you have found the path? And he says, you've known me a long time. Have I ever lied to you? And uh, Kodana says, yeah, you have never, I've never heard you speak anything but the truth. He says, and please listen, my friends. I have found the great way. I will show it to you. You will be the first to hear my teaching. This dharma is not the result of thinking. It is the fruit of direct experience. Listen serenely with all your awareness. And so we had to give us that opportunity of this direct experience of what is it like to turn towards our own suffering, right? What is it like to recognize there is suffering? Um, and he says, my brothers, there are two extremes that a person on the path should avoid. One is to plunge oneself into sensual pleasures, and the other is to practice austerities which deprive the body of its needs. Both lead to failure. The path I've discovered is the middle way. It avoids the extremes and has the capacity to lead one to understanding, liberation, and peace. It is the eight noble, eight noble fold path of right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Why do I call it the right path? It is the right path because it does not avoid or deny suffering. It allows for a direct confrontation with suffering as the means to overcome it. 
So I'm, I'll say that just one more time. <clears throat> I call it the right path because it does not avoid or deny suffering, but allows a direct confrontation with suffering as the means to overcome it. And one thing we were talking about last week in our session is very often the first thing most people hear about Buddhism is there is suffering. And for some people, it's like, oh, yeah, like they got my number. I know what they're talking about. That is true. And for other people, they're like, that is morbid. Like, why would we focus on what's so hard? Like, what are we doing? Like, that's not a why would I like adhere to a path like that? And. Um, so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in that first noble truth. And we had a little discussion last time, but um, yeah, Tig, I'd love, we're both going to share some thoughts and then we would love to, we have some specific questions or prompts from you all to kind of bring this material more to life. I, I wanted to comment too. Um, uh, last week, Eve was talking about the interpretation of what right means and um uh she was sharing the point of view around the wholesome wholesome feels more resonant for i like to think of it as skillful skillful action skillful speech skillful thought skillful mindfulness or constructive you know so it's a little bit less judgy on the on the path <laughs> um so yeah this first noble truth there is suffering you know the first time i heard that i was like uh, that, that didn't, it didn't it wasn't like a big like light bulb moment for me like of course they're suffering I, I suffer all the time why is that a noble truth you know and then it was like through deepening my practice of learning to be with the suffering mm -hmm. and learning how my mind like the insight that I gained from how I respond to the suffering mm -hmm. once I recognized that it was there and that's really the first part of that practice that we just did of recognizing what's here allowing it to be here and investigating it deeply. That's not something that we're taught to do. That's not something that feels like a natural. Usually when they're suffering, our first thing is to try and push it away or make it feel better or at least less bad. Mm. So it is actually kind of paradoxical to actually say, allow it to be here, you know, recognize what it is. Um, I like to call it mindfulness of suffering. You know, we have mindfulness of breath, mindfulness of sensations in the body, mindfulness of thoughts. This is like a combination of all that. How does it mm. feel? How can we bring our awareness to these, these um, experiences of suffering? Um, and I wanted to just share this little <clears throat> anecdotal story. So as many of you know, I teach for a research study at Brown University that is looking at the effect of meditation, mindfulness, compassion on queer people. It's called mindfulness-based queer resilience. Um, so we're just entering our clinical trials this year. And uh, the program is based on the minority stress model of how external discrimination and bias then pushes in and becomes internalized. Mm -hmm. And so we start believing the stories of discrimination. Uh, and this is, this is covering any minority group, whether it's gender, sexual orientation, race, um, ability or disability, neurodiversity. <clears throat> And the researchers wanted me to introduce the program through minor, what minority stress is. And I was like, we know. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need me to tell them what queer suffering is. They live it every day. But I went with it. <laughs> and it was profound or an orientation session when mm. I presented this model of these concentric circles of stress Stress is like a secular word for suffering, right? <laughs> so, and, and then learn, you know, there's a name for this. There's a name for how all of this comes together and feels. And there were tears, you know, to have it named so explicitly that this is minority stress. This is queer stress. It was so powerful for so many of the participants that they felt a sense of affirmation and validation just by it being named, which was, it was a really, you know, when I, when I thought like, okay, big deal, they're suffering, but then to watch them mm -hmm. feel this almost healing, we hadn't even started the course yet. This is just the orientation and they were already feeling 
um, all of this energy around the naming of it. And then, you know, also the fact that it's a government funded research study and that like, you know, we tend to think that the government is kind of out to get us, uh, but like that they're actually paying these participants to come and explore their suffering was also very healing for them. So mm. the importance of just naming the suffering mm. is very healing. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, and thinking again about this first noble truth, you know, often associated with sickness, old age, death, right, which is undeniable and yet somehow totally repressible, right? And especially in the contemporary conditions that we live in, where we're often really separated from, from death and dying, depending on uh, the field of work we are in, that we don't have to see it, it doesn't come that close to us. And yet, you know, as we get older, we see the signs of it, we feel the signs of it, we see it in those around us. And, you know, this suppression, especially of aging and getting older, it's kind of like that, oh, I don't want to be with that truth, right? So just the reality that this is the design of life, it's not an aberration. It's not like something went wrong. That's a normalizing piece. And I think also, you know, I will speak for myself, but maybe many people in the room feel like this, like, I have it really good. You know, like I have people who love me, I have a place that I love to live. Like there's a lot of good in my life and it can almost be hard to feel that my suffering is, is real. Right. Cause I think about suffering in different contexts. It's like, no, that's, that's suffering. I'm just uncomfortable at this moment. And the definitions of suffering, you know, suffering again, it can feel like, Oh no, that's not me. Like other people are suffering. I don't even want to use that word because it diminishes the pain that others are feeling. One of the definitions of, you know, suffering or dukkha is just unsatisfactoriness. <laughs> That's real. Who can get behind it be like things being unsatisfactory? Like even from the beginning of my oat milk latte till the bottom, it is like less satisfactory towards the bottom, right? It's not warm anymore. Like the cardamom drip to the bottom, like whatever, right? Like just that. <laughs> I'm being silly, but like, you know, it is such like it tinges so much of our reality, even the things that are kind of qualitatively good, we can find them unsatisfying. And that's a type of suffering, right? It, it's not the same suffering, maybe as um, you know, losing your home or losing everything or physical illness or difficulty. And yet there is this, this framing of recognizing like, there's kind of this aspect of suffering that's all around us and there's different types you know there's blatant suffering there's kind of the suffering of change things are always changing um i was listening to a little teaching by his holiness the dalai lama on the first noble truth and you know he's very very practical always in in how he says why this might matter for the modern you know contemporary consciousness right this is two thousand years old a very different context and one of the things he says is when our expectation is that there isn't suffering, right? What advertising will sell us, right? Like be better, feel better, do good. Like everything's great. Like you can feel great all the time. That creates a lot of suffering and that there's a realistic view, like a, a mindset, if you will, how we are seeing our life through the context of recognizing suffering that actually is very helpful, very validating, right? To say like, yeah, there's suffering and it's real. I think the worry could be, and I'm like gonna channel my inner mace over here, <laughs> is um, we get lost in that suffering, right? So what is our healthy, wholesome relationship? And I, I like how Tig brought up the mindfulness of suffering. Mindfulness of suffering means that there's awareness, there's presence, curiosity, warmth, we're not like lost, we're not immersed, we're not saturated in suffering, right? We are, you know, aware of our suffering. So our first question for you all, my watch is telling me to stand, you know, that's suffering. Here I am sitting, not meeting my stand goals. <clears throat> um, is, um, yeah, like in this, if we're saying that there's a value to kind of naming and recognizing what unsatisfactoriness or suffering is like, 
Uh, and we had a couple folks last week share, but like, what does that mean? When you hear that first noble truth, there is suffering. How would you say that in words that relate to your own life? Right? Like, I am unsatisfied with the social structures of this country, with the history of this country, with what looks like the future of this country. That's one way I can experience suffering. Like, are there ways for you to make this first noble truth feel real, relevant, present? I see Mace nodding over there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, friends online. Um, so here's like a major source of suffering for me. Um, many of you know my wife, Pamela, who comes here regularly, and we have completely different views about how one should take care of health issues. Mm. Um, I was raised by a doctor and she was raised by a like Wiccan hippie in the middle of no uh, off the grid. And you can just right there. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of suffering mm -hmm. between like when one of us isn't well and like I turn towards Western medicine or she refuses to. And um, it's just like a constant battle of uh, one way versus the other, which neither way is better or worse necessarily. There are certain like cases where one way might be more expedient. Um, <laughs> and I am suffering as I tell you this. So there you go. Yeah. So you're even getting into the second noble truth there. Just good. Yeah. Good foreshadowing. <laughs> Yeah. Go yeah. Do you mind using the mic just so folks can hear us online? I got to come here. Uh, if you can just use this microphone. Yeah. Either way. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So I had this realization. I think we talked about this in Josh's place. So for me, suffering has become very real. When I had this image of me, as a baby mm. at age zero, screaming to be fed. Mm. That's where it starts. Yeah. And the corollary is craving and desire. Mm -hmm. And this has gone on for me for 66 years. Mm. And now the demon is nice and fat, <laughs> fully engorged mm. with all these sufferings mm. using this craving and desire mm. to get big and fat yeah so that's the demon to be faced mm. small ones and big ones yeah it's all feel yeah thank you for sharing that that's such a you know sharing an insight that's so close it's just um yeah amazing to feel and hear how we can connect so many of our life experiences, right? And see it so clearly, like, wow, that's craving. And what I, I shared with you um, on Saturday, it's so interesting because, again, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he says, the very first experience of our life is compassion when our mother's breast is there with milk, right? So it's not one or the other, right? Then I think that's so interesting. Like, there's desire, there's a... The, um, offering if we're so lucky in that way but yeah that craving right which is getting into the second noble truth anyone else with either questions or offerings on that first noble truth yes thank you for the teaching yes i think it, um, from my perspective it's what i relate to is a sense of like there's things i can't control like there's things that are going on in my family and I'm trying to fix them and I can't fix them. And then I feel helpless and I feel kind of stuck in the situation. And I think it's, you know, it's just so interesting to me because I've always thought that the whole suffering thing from a Buddhist perspective was sort of um, a bigger issue. Like my problem, like my toe hurts, that that's like tangential. That's not really like the, the thing that's being talked about is sort of bigger and so as I'm learning this, it just sort of feels like that maybe it's because of my privilege. I've had this, you know, raised white, straight male. I have this ideology that I should be able to fix everything. Mm -hmm. And then when I can't, it sort of feels like I'm running up against the um, 
you know, just get frustrated and I feel ashamed. And I feel so it, mm. it's just sort of like this sense about being a, that there's so much that I don't have control over. Yeah. Feels like that that's how I relate in a kind of a felt way to what is this? What, what do you mean by suffering? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and and thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, it, it uh, even though we're talking about like there's a difference between pain and suffering. Mm. And a lot of times, uh, you know, in a lot of these Dharma practices where it's like, may all beings be free from suffering, it's like get the magic wand out and just poof, it, the suffering's going to be gone. But, you know, what you were describing, there was pain there, pain, you know, specifically in the toe or what's happening with your family. And that's part of it. That's part of our nervous system. That's part of our experience as human beings. It's the suffering that is on top of it that comes from, you know, pain in the toe, then, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to walk. Mm -hmm. And, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do this and this and this, or like the pain of difficulty with the family or wanting to fix something. That's, that might be a felt experience of pain in the body, but then the way that the mind overlays on top of that you know, so a lot of that RAIN practice or mindfulness of suffering, can we be with the pain, stay with the feelings of pain? It takes courage and practice, but stay with those feelings of pain so that we don't go into those realms of the mind where the suffering starts getting applied on top of it. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that that's easy. You know, again, there's no magic wand. It takes practice, but mm. it is helpful to understand like we're not trying to get rid of pain. We're trying to alleviate the suffering that might get layered on top of it. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kelly. Um, and one of the points of suffering for me is the loss of freedom of choice, especially like in addictive ways. Um, and um, the struggle or the or the invitation <laughs> is to um to be in that place of a loss of freedom of choice mm. and um to not judge that like to just meet the powerlessness as it is but the mind my mind always wants to judge it mm. like this is what i'm experiencing this is bad wrong blah 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 i suck whatever and most um to give a tangible example for me um the area where i uh, presently feel the least amount of choice is with um digital devices mm. yeah it yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yes, please. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I'll just squat here for a second. Uh, I'm Lucas. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, I was just, uh, you know, I'm going to maybe kind of be all over the place with this one, but, uh, I just, especially during the, the, the meditation, uh, I was struggling with being, uh, self-compassionate, you know, while we were going through that, that, um, that period of the meditation because, uh, you know, I recently got hit by a car, uh, or I was rear-ended. So I have to deal with, um, a bunch of health insurance stuff, car insurance stuff, which, and then, uh, and then there's elements of pain, not being able to, right. So there's like, like, and then, and then the ideas of, um, you know, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm like, you know, I've been sober like 10 years, so I've got like some addictive, like, you know, uh, behavioral traits that, you know, I'm working through, but, um, I have like this, uh, self, self and entitled aspects you know it's like how do i get as much as i can how do i exploit this you know how do like i i want to lie right to get as much as i can out of the situation uh, in a system that i you know with with like in sh these different levels of insurance that i just don't think that they should exist right mm -hmm. you know and so like i'm suffering over every level of that like the pain that i'm experiencing from the accident um and then, uh, you know, feeling helpless, like in the system that I have to like, 
mm. I feel like I have to manipulate mm. in order to like be accommodated and um and then not knowing like what I guess like the middle path is in that where it's like I'm not um lying I'm not being manipulative I'm not taking advantage of but I am having my needs taken care of because that's the only way that I uh, I, I can operate. Right. And, and that all feels like very out of, I'm having a, a hard time discerning, like what is within my control for that, you know, <laughs> and then what is just out of it. So, and trying not to lie along the way. Anyways, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah. A couple of things come up actually with Kelly and, and Lucas together is I think, um, I do think this idea, you know, we, we have this word of addiction, right? And um, as though it were for one particular aspect of our lives, which are substances that are mind altering. And yet addiction, it really helps us see like the first and second noble truth. Like something feels bad and we just want to get rid of it. And that's often what causes the true suffering, right? So people usually are not turning to whatever it is, like whether it's the digital technology or alcohol or some other thing, because things feel good, right? It's like, you feel bad. And then in an attempt, like in a truly, like you can think of it as kindness, right? In an attempt to be kind, we try to like get away from it or get something else that often ends up creating that additional suffering. And this is not news, but just that, you know, like seeing that relationship and that as Tig was describing that courageousness or that ability to be with the like uncomfortable of, wow, like, I really want to pick up my phone, you know, like, I really want to know, like, I really want to get in there. And it's, uh, it's, it can be painful. And then I think to Lucas's point, like, then there can be all these layers, like, I'm in physical pain, I have to deal with like, bureau bureaucratic paperwork, and I'm in a profoundly corrupt capitalist system, right? So there's like, and it can be very hard to find, you know, okay, if the first noble truth is there's suffering and the second is there are causes, like what's causing it? Is it capitalism? Am I just like, is it, I mean, yes. But like every week I gotta bring that up. Just, but I feel like there's also, um, you know, there's like, we are involved in that too. Like where can we take, you know, a real clear, stable, steady look at how we're contributing to our own suffering. And that's the hard work of the second noble truth is like, you know, like Sarun was saying, like, I see this is my desire, 66 years, right? I see the demon of it. And when we look at that second noble truth, it's recognizing that it's, you know, there's the pain, inevitable pain of the foot or whatever it is. And then the suffering um, that we add on to it either by trying to escape it or often, you know, these other secondary things we reach towards to try to cover it up. Right. And that is such a, um, that is a backdraft as a painful one, you know, opening, opening ourselves compassionately to see that clearly it is absolutely the path to liberation, but like a painful place to hang out. Yeah, some of you may have heard this term avoidance driven coping. And so in the queer avoidance driven coping. And so in the queer resilience course, we use this as a, like it creates these habit loops. So our attempt to avoid the pain then spirals us into these habitual patterns that keep us locked there. Mm. And the beauty, and it's it's like, you know, perfect dharma. <laughs> is that it's awareness of that and then compassion for it are mm -hmm. the antidotes that kind of help cut some of that. Well, in theory and over time with practice, it mm -hmm. can help cut a lot of the, the spiraling that that avoidance driven coping, the maladaptive coping mechanisms that uh, arise from that can create. On to the second noble truth. Do it. So, you know, I think, Again, you know, just this idea that it's often, you know, sometimes called the second arrow or this way we contribute further to our own suffering. I have a, a friend and colleague who's going through some excruciating um, back pain, and I've I have had that myself. And really, there's no advice. Everyone has a different body. Like advice is annoying. Like you probably looked up everything you could possibly do. And I said the only thing I can tell you is 
you're not alone. It's not your fault. That's it. You know, because we start to, you know, the extra, like, there's so much pain when you have, like, herniated disc and sciatica. Like, you're just, like, in excruciating nerve pain. And then there's the, like, what's wrong with my body? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to them? Like, why me? I'm never going to, it's never going to, never going to stop. I'm going to lose all these things I love. And that additional suffering, that's like the optional part, right? That's why this becomes our path of liberation is we start to be able to see like what we can, we can lighten our load. There's the actual pain. That, that's just real. That's just the truth. And then that extra part, like the, the optional or extra, that's where we can, yeah, start to have that compassion and that wisdom to to try and you know get underneath that urge to add on to it and it's not that we can't feel afraid feel angry you know like he said to me first and he said so my goddamn back like i'm so mad at my back and i said okay you can feel mad don't hang out there right be constructive with this anger it's a natural response to feel frustrated but the constructive way that we can be with these emotions that can end up being very destructive and harmful that are the root of the suffering part of our pain i i um the second noble truth for me you know like the 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 attachment and the aversion and i think about the movement of those two things like attaching the clinging like we're reaching out and grabbing and trying to like get more or get something again uh it's like this motion of coming in and then the aversion is this pushing away i don't want to feel this way um and so if it's like this movement of like aggressive pushing forward and so uh, sometimes I, I think very visually and so a lot of times when i think about second noble truth for me it's like this <laughs> right? this is suffering trying to grab and push away that's that's the root of suffering and then how pleasant it is to be here, mm. you know, to like take a deep breath through the central channel, straight in the spine, you know, and like, hey, I'm feeling the craving. I want to reach out and grab and cling, but I can also just savor, you know, and not attach to it. Or in like that rain practice, I want to push this away. I don't want to go to the pain, painful area. But that pushing creates resistance, mm -hmm. you know, and so if we can just be if we can practice being centered, grounded, um, then there's a bit more uh, ability to be actually be with the pleasant things rather than knocking off center and trying to grab it. And we completely miss the opportunity to be with it. Mm. So we were curious. So for I think I came up already some folks were. Um, and giving us some foreshadowing into their uh, second noble truth strategies, trying to control things, for example, right? That is one way that we can respond to pain. Like, I just feel like I should be able to. And so appreciate you bringing up, right, that our, our privilege or entitlement can, can fuel that, right? This idea that, you know, I have all this efficacy, I can, I can make it happen. And I'm curious... You know, in hearing about this second noble truth, are there like habits or patterns, like ways that you contribute to the the suffering? Like, is there a strategy you're on to yourself about? So way back years ago, I think we were, there was a, a part in the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life when we were reading it together as a group. And um, Shantideva says it's so important for you to I think it's like confess your neurotic thought crimes, right? <laughs> so it's not just a tearing yourself down. It's like bringing it out and like, you know, getting kind of clear on it. And Chogyam Trumpa also really thought that was so powerful for us to name. Um, so are there ways that you're on to yourself about how you contribute? Friends online too? Anybody? I see Claudia smiling. I see a lot of smiling. <laughs> yeah, I still and Gina both smiling. They know about those habits. <laughs> yeah, head nodding. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so one thing that I have noticed recently is that, uh, let's say I have some obsessive thought about some obsessive, you know, getting obsessed over someone or something, right? And then it really stops me from um, concentrating, and especially during meditation. So it's, I feel restless, it's hard to sit. And then, uh, and then I noticed that, I mean, I don't know the right answer, but I just noticed that one one thing I suffer with definitely is trying to sit and trying to not, you know, like get rid of that obsessive thought. But then I don't have any solution like, well, it is there. And then so let's say one hour of meditation, it's, you know, going to that thought and then come back, going, going and coming back. So it's um, exhausting and it mm. doesn't match the ideal, <laughs> which, you know, is, uh, you know, the, the space that you experience mm. um but it definitely adds to the suffering to think that it shouldn't be this way yeah. so but i don't know how it should be yes i will yeah can i ask yeah you mm -hmm. answer you, you mentioned the word ideal yeah mm -hmm. and, um, and mm -hmm. yeah what is that what is your ideal practice um i think the ideal is usually that um the lack of thoughts or at least obsessive thoughts, um, what comes out of it sometimes is some form of realization mm. or for example, realizing that what different things like what loving means to me, what different parts of loving um, another person or caring for another person means. Mm. But then when I have these obsessive thoughts and I don't have that calm going on, I feel like nothing comes out of it. So, mm. but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, that's your experience. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, you know, this is, this is one of the opportunities that we have and, and let's, let's like really name specifically mindfulness, you know, mm -hmm. like the practice of, you know, being with a sensory experience, whether it's the breath or even thoughts as a sensory experience and the expectation that it would be ideal, that it would be calm or pleasant. And a lot of what the invitation in mindfulness particularly is, it's the way that it is. So, oh, I'm, I have this repeating thought for, you know, I did a body scan yesterday for 45 minutes and I don't know any of it. I actually made it into the body, but that was one of my deepest practices because it was, I was noticing where my mind was going. And, you know, for you, it sounds like it's the obsessive thought. So there's some options there, you know, maybe this is a practice in observing the mind mm -hmm. and can I stay with the obsessive thought and how, what, what comes up in my body when I follow this thought? So instead of the breath or a sensation in the body, the object of your mindfulness could be that, that obsessive thought and just stay with it. Mm -hmm. If you can't beat it, join it. You know, and I think the, the big thing to say, there there is a perception that when we practice in this way, that it's going to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns mm -hmm. and pleasant and beautiful, and we're going to get all this insight. And I like to keep reminding myself that this is a training ground. And when we're training, it's hard and there's mm -hmm. resistance and it's unpleasant. It's like the gym, you know, it's like that resistance that makes it, makes us, our, our uh, ability to be present stronger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some things to, to try out, because I think that that's very normal, what your experience is a very natural aspect of both the mind and what happens in meditation. So kind of just defining the playing ground a little bit more. What's the intention for the practice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so does this mean that um, when the obsessive thought is there, um, to not come back to, let's say, let's say if the object of meditation is breathing does it mean to go with the thought and not come back because if i go and come back go and come back it's like you said in like 100 times happens in like five minutes then then that's what is exhausting so mm -hmm. does it mean to not come back and uh i probably don't know how to create a balance there you have a choice 
to, you want this practice to be about going and coming back, which is certainly valid. That's what my experience with that body scan was. It was a constant going back and forth. But I also know that that's what's strengthening my ability to be present. You know, if the mind didn't wander, we wouldn't really need to practice, right? Yeah. So, um, so you can choose, you know, for me, when that happens, I can say, okay, I'm actually going to stay with this back and forth for this practice, or I'm going to actually just recommit a new intention to staying with where my mind keeps going mm -hmm. and exploring it a little bit more so you have agency in that you have choice yeah makes sense thank you hmm. anyone else habits yeah great So in listening to this discussion, um, I guess my form of suffering in this realm usually involves the word should mm. or, sh or shouldn't. <laughs> like, I feel X, but I should feel Y. Yeah. Or I feel X and I shouldn't feel that way. Um, and then when I started like a kind of a dabbling in meditation and practice and stuff. There's a whole other layer of shoulds. <laughs> I was like, I should feel X. Uh, you know, I feel X. I should feel Y. Damn it. Like, why can't I accept that I feel X? You know, like it was just like a whole other. It was just like an uh, endless kind of spiral mm. of uh not even not even being able to accept my non-acceptance <laughs> <laughs> master class yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i should get some sort of certificate <laughs> um so yeah that's that that, that that's what that kind of looks like for me mm. as like it, it, it as I, I always know that my brain is up to something when i start thinking in terms of should and shouldn't yeah yeah that's it thanks thank you what i um what like what i hear in that and this might be my flavor of shooting um is is doubt you know i often get a sense of real like is this the right thing is this the right thing you know just this way of not being able to um accept what's happening and uh, it does, it causes so much suffering. And it's interesting because, you know, here we are hanging out in the first two truths. I hope we get to the third uh, because it is that there is a possibility of, of cessation. And that can further contribute to a sense of, well, why isn't it now? Right. And I, I do think it's interesting. It can be very hard to feel patience in our practice um, and to feel confidence in our practice. And to have a sense that it there is a value. And that's why I love to bring up like the intention of our practice, not the outcome, but the intention. And like how good can we get at having a clear intention? And part of that is being able to see clearly, right? And so even if we're noticing our obsessive mind or our um, you know, perfectionist tendencies or desire to control. We're, be, we're getting clearer and clearer on what is contributing to our suffering. And ideally, being able to get clearer and clearer on what would support us. What, what a clear intention could be that would help us feel more at ease, accepting, so that we could be available. Because all these, all these kind of, you know, second noble truth areas, they prevent us from being authentic with each other. Like we're so caught up in our own process and our own <clears throat> experience that it really gets in the way, it really gets in the way. I think I saw that Claudia had a hand, but she put it down. Do you still want to share something with us? Oh, we oh, still can't on. hear. Hold on, Claudia. Can you unmute? She did, but we still can't hear her. Hi.
Let's hope it's not the suffering of being unheard. We can't hear. Yeah. In the chat? Yeah. Maybe you can put it in the chat. Can you write it in the chat for us? For some reason, the microphone isn't working. Does it work now? Yes. I think I'm having problems with my headphones because it was breaking up. It was breaking up constantly. You know, I couldn't hear you several times. So I, I uh, well, I was saying technology is the worst. I'm with you. Okay. Well, <laughs> I um, I am curious. I wanted to ask Teague about the I in rain. Because um, when you were talking about like difficult, difficult emotions, I, I have for many years been struggling with like working with anger, you know, and uh, I get triggered very easily. And I think part of it is I, because of my family of origin, I have trouble with authority time. <laughs> and so when I feel the anger, I guess my question is with the I is, is it about investigating what is it that triggers it mm. and, 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 and just feeling it and throwing, if you want, like that question to the universe or my subconscious or whatever, because otherwise mm. it would lead me to thinking. Mm. And I don't want to be thinking. I just want to be with it, stay with it, and try to figure out, okay, so what's triggering this? And, and then how can I work with it, right? I mean. One of the things, thank you for that question. I think there's a lot of nodding of heads in the room, so you're not alone. Uh, I think, you know, something that I learned from Eve <laughs> is that the emotions happen very quickly. The reason why we might feel that emotion for a longer part of time is exactly what you pointed to, is because we're thinking about it. And then we re-trigger ourselves. And so the I is really about practicing the ability to stay in the felt experience of the emotion. And it actually interrupts that kind of vicious cycle mm -hmm. of feeling, thinking, feeling, thinking. It's hard to do this. You know, it does take practice to just stay with it. That's why I love the kind of like, there's a lot of different prompts. Is there a color? Is there a texture? Is there a shape? Is there movement? Is there a border where we can feel it and where we can't? And if I, if I really commit to spending a couple minutes doing that, a lot of times I'm like, what, what was it? You know? <laughs> And then, and then as you know, the handshake practices that Eve offers a lot of times, it mm. just, the more that we stay with the feeling, mm. paradoxically, it's oftentimes will start dissolving. Mm. Mm. Right. You know, I, I have felt start. that. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. I also want to offer Claudia, you know, I think the way we even conceptualize often these these habits or patterns that we've learned to try to deal with pain is it, it solidifies them, right? So I hear you say, I, I've struggled with anger. And I will say, I have seen you really develop such a beautiful practice around anger. You know, like it's just a different way, right? And in, you know, fast forward to um, the fourth noble truth, which is these wholesome or skillful ways. And sometimes that's like pulling it out by the roots, but it's so hard. Like you said, it's our family of origin, it's conditioning. And often it's like, what else we're planting around that? What mm -hmm. are the seeds, the wholesome, skillful seeds that grow up? You know, they're alongside those habits and patterns. They're more beneficial, right? So setting our standards to something that feels more doable like okay i'm trying to like loosen the grip of this thing while like really making fertile ground for these other aspects to have space too because yeah. in a way in a way i guess i mean i am trying and yes i agree i i mean i don't want to brag but yes i have made some progress see it brag yeah. see it celebrate it <laughs> you. Yeah. But uh, I guess it's the grasping, right? It's probably because anger can also be addictive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and we can hang on and grasp to those feelings and maybe like a vicious circle or something like that. And so, mm -hmm. but I guess being aware, 
and uh, yeah. <laughs> just to kind of shade yes. one of the things that was part of your original question claudia was like when do i explore the why you know and in the emotional balance course that we mm. teach there's uh there's the timeline and so retrospectively kind of like hindsighting but that's a little bit separate than the rain practice and the investigative practice that's mm. something it's still a contemplative practice but maybe that's more of like journaling reflecting talking to a friend or a therapist to explore the why but you're right that that is that is thinking so we can continually re-trigger ourselves when we go to that place but sometimes it's important to do so to get that mm. insight so, so what you're saying, I guess, when we're meditating, we're we're feeling it with sensing. It. We don't want the story. We don't want the narrative, right? I mean, it's just like being with it, being in that particular it. practice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Eve has taught us. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just say it out loud again? The first two noble truths. They're suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Fair causes of suffering and causes of suffering. Attachment and aversion. Yeah. Yeah. I like to take that one step further and say, you know, it's like our deluded mind that sees everything as separate from ourselves. And then that leads to the attachment and the aversion. But that's, you know, another topic. And the third and fourth, which we will not get to probably tonight altogether is is the um yeah is the good news right if if we stopped there be like great <laughs> glad to know i'm not alone in uh in this but um this idea that there is the potential for us to transform and that there is a path for transformation and it's just so such a beautiful pairing and again i feel like especially the fourth like the path for transformation is all the ways that we can, again, like cultivate these wholesome, skillful qualities in our life, everything from what we're doing in the world, how we're thinking and how we're making our livelihood, like bringing this, um, a skillful, wholesome, clear way of being. And that's not like skillful, wholesome, like that's not some sort of high moralistic value. It's, it's something in which we are aligned with our purpose and values, our, our sense of I want to be free from the suffering. I don't want to contribute to more delusion. You know, nothing fancy. I think, you know, because we're not really going to get a lot of, we're not going to have time tonight to go deeper into the good news. You know, one of the things that we were talking about that to point out, and for those online, you can't see it, but just above our heads is the Dharma wheel. And there's eight spokes to that in this negative space. And it's those eight spokes that are the path to the liberation of suffering. And so this has been kind of formed into the light, like the sun, like this is the, this is the sunshine of the Dharma, mm. that walking this path, it's hard, it's, it's lifetimes of practice, but this is the warmth. This mm -hmm. is where we can start to experience some of that hope for change. And if there were an easier way to do it, we wouldn't, none of us would be here, right? If there was anything other way to like get underneath that, um, that core suffering, you know, we would try it, but it really is this kind of steady and continual path where we are finding a little bit of that freedom. And that's why I appreciate Claudia, you recognizing like, yeah, like I have a little more freedom and it is important for us along the way to be able to kind of have that sense of spiritual confidence, not arrogance, not pride, but recognizing like, oh yeah, like I've learned things or I'm more aware of my body or kindness comes easier for me looking for like the signs, you know, the wholesomeness that starts to kind of fill us up. Um, we will do a little dedication of merit for our practice together. Um, uh, before you do that, Eve, uh, this is Walt. I have a, a question from, uh, yeah. from in the chat. Uh, can you recommend a book on the Four Noble Truths? Oh, boy. Can I get back to that person next next two weeks from now, actually? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, it, it's covered in almost every core Dharma text, so it's, like, hard to choose. Um, yeah. 
don't know. Do you have one? Old pathway pops. Old pathway pops. <laughs> <laughs> An additional. Yeah. What chapter is it? We are on chapter. He will go on to this teaching a bit more in three chapters from now, but we're on chapter 22. Oh no, this thing is long. A lot of chapters in there. Yeah, 81. Don't worry, we still have plenty left. I, I know, like, like Tig, I, I feel like I could start the book the minute I finish it all over again. So no need to worry, many more chapters ahead. So yeah, let's take a moment and re-inhabit with our attention and awareness, the space of the body and the breath. Mm, feeling if there's any sense of how these ideas and discussions may have started to shift or change anything in the heart and the body or the mind. Maybe there are just little tiny threads of ideas or inspirations that will continue to weave together and grow. We consider the potential and possibility that our time here together may have benefit for ourselves. And we dedicate a potential benefit, anything we can learn and gain and strengthen from. We offer it up, knowing that the work we are doing here together is in service to the greater good. So dedicating our practice tonight so that all beings could know the true causes of happiness, that all beings could know the true causes of suffering, and that all beings could be free. Thank you. 